Welcome to the Peace Haven Weekly Podcast. Weekly message audio from Peace Haven Baptist Church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. We continue our study in Leviticus, called into the presence of the King, with this question and answer session 1. We thank you for listening and be sure to visit us at www.findpeace.today. All right, good morning. So, um, this week we're, we're going to be, or today, um, we're going to be doing just kind of a question and answer session um, in Leviticus through what we've covered so far. Um, we've been through the first seven chapters. Uh, Amanda and I were talking last night. She was like, where, where are you going to be at? And uh, I said, you know, remember it's the Q&A session. And she said, oh, yeah. So how many chapters have we been through? We've been through like seven, right? Because um, we we talked about the the offering, and then um, remember those are split up to where the the priestly responsibilities are on kind of the backside of of different chapters, and uh, so we talked about that uh, a little bit. But um, the questions this morning are from kind of hallway conversations that I've had with some people. Um, because typically if, if someone has a question or something's unclear, um, then it's probably unclear to, to more than just that single individual. Um, and so I, I thought, well, this would be a, a good time to, to look at that. Um, then some maybe from, from email um, or some from, from just looking on the Internet and, and seeing what uh, our common questions about Leviticus or, or about where we've been through. Uh, so we'll look at those this morning. And with some of these, you, you may get more than what is asked. Um, and that's okay. Um, so that it, we're learning together. Um, that, that's what we want to do here. Um, we, we want to, to know God's Word. Uh, we want to understand uh, God's word, because if we don't understand what we're reading, if we don't understand what we're studying. Um, we really can't take it to the next level. We talked about that in our Sunday school class this morning about um, before we can apply things, before we can get to practical application of, of stuff, we have to really understand um, what God is communicating. Um, but we also want to be able to answer questions that you know outsiders uh, might have uh, for us. Especially when you know Leviticus, it's it's ironic because Leviticus is probably the book we we don't study. Um, you know, we, we don't see a lot of people doing studies on Leviticus, but that's the questions that that people have the most uh, about. That's the book that that people have the most questions about, or the most arguments about. And, and so um, it's good for us, I think, to to look through this. Uh, book to see what God is, is saying, try to understand that to the, the best of our ability, uh, to be able to apply it and be able to have conversations with, with other people. And so I wanted to start this morning with um, probably the most common question. I, I did have several people kind of come up and ask me this um, over the past few weeks. Uh, the most common question that we've we've had is did everyone have to bring an offering daily, uh, or was it just the priest? And so this is about primarily the, the two daily offerings. Um, if you remember when we talked about the uh, Olah offering, the burn offering, uh, those are to be offered in the morning and then in the evening. So twice every day those offerings are uh, brought and uh, you know, we as we kind of worked our way through it, we see that not only are the the burnt offerings offered, but the uh, grain offering is um, there's a grain offering offered with that, and then later on a, a drink offering offered with those offerings. So two of those are, are offered every day, and this is a, a really good question. Um, it, I was very pleased that uh, people were thinking about that, um, having kind of this realization in your mind. Um, because it, it's kind of a, a logistics question. Um, and so it, it's a really good question. If there are hundreds of thousands of Israelites, uh, if there are, we estimate, 
uh, between 600,000 to 2.5 million people uh, that are in the wilderness um, that are delivered during the Exodus. Uh, how would they get all of this done every day uh, if each person offered uh, these offerings? That's, that's kind of all they would do, right? If everybody had to bring two offerings, that's, that's all they would get done. And, and not only that, um, but wouldn't they run out of animals? This would be like an extinction level event if, if they had to offer these uh, every day. And so uh, the first thing I want to say is, is trust your logic here. Um, that it's, it's very encouraging that we have these questions, but um, God is not a God of confusion. And, and so when you think about that and think about it logically and how this would happen, um, you can trust your logic um, because God is not illogical. And so it, it would be impossible uh, for every Hebrew to bring two of these offerings daily. That, that would be uh, all that they would get done. Uh, there's, there's too many people. Uh, there's not enough time in the day. Um, and there wouldn't be enough resources. There, there would not be enough livestock for this to happen. And so what is happening is the priests are offering the burnt offerings twice daily on behalf of the nation. Um, and so not to confuse you, but the answer is, is kind of yes, uh, because the, the priests are doing this, but they're doing it on behalf of, of the people. Um, and so the, the priest, when we think about the, the priest, uh, we have to remember that these are the, they're serving as mediators between uh, God and the rest of, of the nation. And so uh, at some times we'll, we'll see them speaking and acting on behalf of, of God, representing God to the people. And then sometimes they're going to God, and that's what they're doing through these burnt offerings, um, going to God, representing the, the people. And so they're, they're mediators. Um, there, there would be times that individuals uh, would bring an offering um, on their own, their own personal offering, but that wouldn't be daily. Um, hopefully it wouldn't be daily um, because we, we saw that when that would happen is, is uh, after a severe ritual impurity, and so they would bring a, a burn offering or a, a purification offering if uh, they had had leprosy and, and had been uh, away from the camp to, to be able to be pronounced clean after being healed from le leprosy. Uh, bringing a, a burnt offering, a purification offering. Um, then we saw uh, with the, the reparation offering or the, uh, the guilt offering uh, that, that they would bring this after a specific offense against either God or, or their neighbor. And so there's some sin that they personally have committed um, and they need to, to make that right. Um, and they're aware of that. And so they bring their, their personal offering um, uh, and have the priest sacrifice and offer that on their behalf. Um, and then with the uh, the peace offering, we saw that any time that they wished to, to show appreciation for uh, God's provision, uh, they would bring a, a peace offering, and, and we saw that that would include any time someone experienced kind of a, a near-death experience. So um, after a, a long journey, after being away for a while, after uh, traveling, uh, over sea uh, or, or being out at sea for a period of time um, and being brought home safely, they may offer that. Or um, when God answered a prayer, um, remember if we see examples of this in, in Scripture to where God, if, if you will give me a child, then I'll, I'll uh, devote that child to you and I'll offer you offerings as a, a response to you answering my prayer. And then spontaneously they could offer these as an act of worship. And so uh, the answer is uh, individuals uh, occasionally would bring these personal offerings as needed or required, but the, uh, the daily burn offerings, those that happened each day, twice uh, each day, uh, were offered by the, the priest, performed by the priest uh, on behalf of the people. And so uh, kind of going along with that, and a, another really good logistics question that uh, people have asked, or where did the uh, priest, where did the priest get all of the animals that were used for these offerings? Um, this is a good question, especially if you are familiar with the Levites and how God um, 
kind of treated the, the tribe of, of Levi uh, after the, the land is, is split up uh, among the nations. The Levites are the, the priestly tribe. Uh, if you remember when we were in Exodus and Aaron uh, kind of makes the golden calf and, and Moses comes down from Sinai and he sees all of this idol worship going on, um, he kind of gives them an, the people an ultimatum and says, uh, if you side with God, you know, come with me. And the only tribe to, to really respond to that um, it is the tribe of, of the Levites. And so they are treated um, in a different way by, by God. Uh, and so they become the, the priestly tribe. Uh, and so all priests are part of the tribe of Levi, uh, but all, not all Levites were priests. Um, those that weren't priests were considered kind of laymen, um, but they could help to, to carry and, and move the tabernacle, they, they could approach the, the holy, thing of, uh, holy things of, of God and be able to, to move those as the, the tabernacle needed to, to be moved. Um, later on, the Levites, uh, not only serving as priests, but some of them would be um, kind of elders in some of the cities, uh, kind of navigating and, and teaching the, the law of God. Uh, later on, kind of being prominent in synagogues and, and those kind of things. Um, but what is distinct about the, the Levites is they weren't given any land. And so in Numbers, kind of take a, a detour here, uh, but in Numbers 18, uh, the Levitical priest, this is God speaking, all the, the tribe of Levi shall have no portion or inheritance with Israel. They shall eat the Lord's food offerings as their inheritance they shall have no inheritance among their brothers. The Lord is their inheritance as He promised them. And so uh, each of the, the 12 tribes um, of Israel is, is promised an allotment of land uh, in Canaan, uh, to, a, a place to, to settle. Uh, each tribe is given an allotment, but the Levites did not receive an allotment of land. Uh, the Lord was to be their inheritance and was to provide for them uh, for their service and their work. Uh, he was to, to be their provision. And so uh, you can already see kind of why this is a, a question or why this was a question. Um, if you don't have any land, uh, then you have no fields, right? And so no fields means you're, you're not planting crops. You uh, have no source of, of food, no source of uh, kind of income to, to sell those crops. Uh, without an income or uh, any fields, then how will these people survive? Where will they um, get their own food and provision? And then where, what will they do with, with the animals? And where did they get the animals? And so uh, you can see kind of part of this answer here even in Numbers uh, that their inheritance is the, they shall eat the, the Lord's food offering as their inheritance. Um, and so all the offerings, excluding the, the burnt offerings, included food portions for the priest, right? And so, uh, again, if you think about having 600,000 people uh, to two and a half million people, um, along with those daily burn offerings, there's, there's most likely going to be someone uh, in Israel that's, that's bringing some kind of offering almost daily. Um, but even if that wasn't the case, um, the Levites had a, a reserve they had provision in the form of tithes that they received each year from the people. And so this is later on in, in Numbers 18. Uh, to the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for the service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tent of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout your generations and among the people of Israel. They shall have no inheritance for the tithe of the people of Israel, which they present as a contribution to the Lord. I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said of them that they shall have no inheritance among the people of Israel. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Moreover, you shall speak to the Levites when you take from the people of Israel the tithe that I have given you. Uh, from them for your inheritance, then you shall present a contribution from it to the Lord, a tithe of the tithe. And so 
A tithe here means a, a tenth. Uh, that's what the, the word tithe means in Hebrew. Uh, there's actually three different tithes that uh, the people offered each year uh, or every three years, depending on the tithe. Um, so the, they had the, the Levitical tithe, which we just read about in, in Numbers 18. Uh, then they had a tithe of, of feast that's described in Deuteronomy 14. Um, and this was a, a time when uh, everyone would also tithe off of the, the harvest that they had. And it was supposed to be a big celebration. And so uh, everyone gave their 10%. And so um, if you were poor, you gave your 10%. If you were more wealthy, you gave your, your 10%. And, and so it kind of balanced out. And they had this big party. And the, the poor might be able to eat a little bit better than they usually could. Uh, and the wealthy people uh, were still able to, to eat well. And they, they had this feast, uh, these feasts, and they would come together as a, a community. Uh, and then we, the, the third tithe is a, a tithe for the poor. And this happened uh, every three years. And so every three, three years they would give a tithe um, for those people that were in the nation that were poor and they could uh, take of that tithe and have their, their needs uh, met. And so uh, the, the Levitical tithe is how God is providing for the Levites. Um, God has, has blessed Israel. Again, here, here's the picture that we're seeing, that God has blessed Israel. God's blessed these people. And so God gets a tenth. And we, we even saw that again last week when we're, we were talking about the, uh, the drink offering. And remember Jacob, uh, he says, God, if you'll bring me back to this land, um, then I'll, I'll give you a tenth of everything that you, you bless me with. And so that idea carries through. And so that's the origination of, of kind of this tithe language. And, and again, the idea is that God has blessed me um, with a harvest. He's blessed me with, with crops, with uh, new livestock with, with land. Um, and so I'm going to give part of that back to God. And then even notice um, the Levites, the, the priest who received a, a tenth from the people, they were to, to give a tenth of what they had to God as well. And so uh, that's where the language of, of a, ten, a tithe of a tithe or a tenth of a tenth uh, comes into play because uh, same thing for them. God is providing for them, Right. Um, and, and we can really see that with the, the Levitical priesthood because they, they don't have these farmlands. They're not raising their crops. They're totally dependent on um, what God is providing for them through the tithe of the people. And so God has blessed them too, and so they're, they're going to give back to God as well. Um, and so uh, part of that tenth, part of that tithe was livestock. And we see that in Leviticus 27. We're, we're not there yet, but to answer the question, um, every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is holy, uh, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, he shall add a fifth to it. We, we did talk about that. Um, and every tithe of the herds and the flocks, every tenth animal of all that pass under the herdsman's staff shall be holy to the Lord. And so... Each year, uh, there were, were newborns, there were uh, new livestock that would, would be born to the herds and the flocks, and they would be made to pass through a, a gate, and there would be a, a shepherd that had a, a, a staff, and they would dip that staff in a, a, a colored liquid, and then every tenth animal, they would touch the animal and, and mark the animal and say, okay, this one belongs to God, and so uh, it would be designated for uh, the priest and for their service uh, in the tabernacle. Um, and so, uh, again, the question kind of falls back to, well, uh, they get every tenth animal, but if they don't have any land, where, where do they keep them, right? Um, and, and so you see that there's this logical progression, and, and so we, we want to answer these questions. And so uh, the flocks and herds were kept on Levitical pasture lands. Um, and so it, it's true that uh, the priest did not receive a, a territory. And so you can see kind of on the... I'm pointing there. You're not looking that way. Um, sorry. Uh, so you, you can see the, the kind of different colors here. Um, those kind of represent the allotments of, of land for each tribe. Um, those red dots are Levitical cities. And so 
while the Levites did not get a, a huge territory of land to, to populate um, that belonged to their tribe, uh, what God does instead is He, he says you're, you're going to, to have cities that belong to the Levites within these lands. And so uh, there are, are six cities of refuge, uh, and then there are uh, 42 um, cities that are, are Levitical cities. Uh, so 48 cities in all um, that are belong to the Levites. And so uh, God gave the tribes the land, and, and see, even the land, this, this is cool, uh, I, I think it's cool, uh, even the land is kind of treated like a tithe because this is how this pans out, right? God has given me this territory, He's given me this land, and so now I'm going to give part of that uh, in the form of these Levitical cities back to God and, and God to, to use for His service and the worship uh, of God. So it's given to these Levites to use. And so the way the, the Levitical cities worked is you had your city um, and then uh, two, uh, let's see, it's 2,000 cubits, uh, which is about 3,000 feet of an outer belt around the city. Um, that was to be used for pasture lands. And so this is where uh, those animals would be kept as they passed under the staff, every tenth animal. Um, this was a place for them to, to kind of graze and, and hang out until they were needed to be used uh, by the priesthood. And so, again, the, the tithes provided for the priest and their service. Um, God provided atonement. Um, God provided the food for these people, blessed them with land, blessed them with uh, herds and flocks, and, and they are giving back to God what He has given them. Um, big key takeaway, if you don't hear anything else from this past thing, um, again, we see God requiring what God has provided. Um, that, that's awesome, guys. If you don't get anything else, that's the gospel. And we see it in this picture in, in Leviticus, God requiring what God has provided. And so, uh, moving on to the, the next question, uh, and this one, I thought was going to be uh, kind of a, here you go, um, but I, I kind of looked at it and kind of went down a rabbit trail. I kind of warned Trexler and, and Keith this morning. Um, and so we kind of joke about this, um, but the next question is something along the lines of, should we eat our steaks well done? Um, yeah, amen. My answer to that is, is please don't. Um, if you want beef jerky, they sell it in bags. And you can buy that. But, uh, yeah. So, uh, this has to do with, with eating a, a steak rare. Um, and we often, we do often joke, you know, and, and say it, it's still bleeding. Um, and, and so we joke about that. But um, it is a, a question worth reflecting on and, and looking at, uh, being able to answer and it has to do with the, the details, uh, especially of the peace offering. If you remember when we went over the peace offering, we uh, saw several statements like this. It is a statue forever uh, throughout your generations that you shall not eat the blood. Uh, anyone who eats the blood will be cut off from his people. You shall not eat blood because life is in the blood. And so as we looked at the, the peace offering, um, we saw those prohibitions from God about eating blood and this respect that we're supposed to have for blood. Um, but another reason this is, is kind of a question, uh, and this is kind of where the, the rabbit trail part comes in, is we see this restated in the New Testament, um, in Acts 15 specifically. If you remember, the Jerusalem council is, is meeting uh, the some of the apostles and, and some of the elders of the churches have, have kind of gathered together to um, discuss Gentile converts to, to Christianity, um, to this, the way, um, and, and to believing and confessing in, in Jesus, and they're getting saved, and the Holy Spirit is um, doing works through them, and, and so they're, they're not quite sure how to respond to that. What, where does that fit in, and, and how um, what to do about that? And so... Some of the people, uh, known as the, the Judaizers, were, were saying, 
Um, in order for Gentiles to be truly saved, then they have to undergo circumcision. And, and so there was this big debate, and they had a, a council in Jerusalem and, and talked about um, the witnesses for the Gentiles being um, converted, uh, being believers. And they determined that uh, salvation is through faith in Jesus alone, uh, both for the, the Gentile and the, the Jewish believer um, that would believe and, and trust in Jesus and what he had done on the cross. Um, but they do, uh, they decide that it's not required uh, for a Gentile to be circumcised, to, to be a Christian, to be saved. Uh, but they do set some guidelines for Gentiles to live out their faith. And so in Acts uh, 15, 28, uh, James is kind of heading this up and uh, they write a letter and they, they say, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas who uh, themselves will tell you the same things by the word of mouth for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. And so it's a very short, uh, to-the-point letter uh, that they write, um, a message that they send to these Gentile believers. Uh, but James does provide these uh, four prohibitions. So um, he says, Stay away from food sacrificed to idols, from consuming or, or drinking blood, uh, to stay away from things strangled. And, and so this would be, uh, an animal that is not properly drained of blood, and, and so the, the blood has congealed in, in the meat and the fat, um, and then from sexual immorality. And so that, again, is anything, uh, any act, sexual act outside of, of God's design for marriage. And what is interesting um, is all four of these, guess where they come from? Leviticus. We haven't got there yet, uh, but they come from Leviticus 17 and 18. And so even here in the <clears throat> early church, uh, as James gives these four prohibitions for the Gentiles, um, his source material is from Leviticus. And so the question that we, we have to ask is how does this uh, apply to us today? And so... Uh, the first thing, there, there are debates about this. There are, there are disagreements about this. Uh, I'll tell you that up front. But the first thing that we want to remember is uh, this isn't a requirement for salvation. Uh, we're, we're saved by grace through faith. Uh, we're saved by what Jesus has done for us. And, and really the, the message, we see it in this, if you keep yourselves from these, you do well. And so, uh, really, it's kind of another way of saying it. If you want to uh, practice excellence, then, then keep these things. Um, not, not keep these and, and be saved, okay? And so, uh, this is not a stipulation for salvation, um, but he's saying if you want to live out your faith as a Gentile, um, then you, you, you would do well to, to keep these things. And so the point is good practice of, of lining up uh, with God's purpose and, and design for His cre creation, uh, His purpose and design for us as, as human beings. And so we have to remember uh, God's law is, is good. Uh, it teaches us about who He is and, and who He created us to be. Um, the law cannot save us. Uh, but that doesn't mean we, we throw the baby out with the bathwater, as the saying goes. Um, and so we, we saw that, hopefully, as we uh, went through Exodus and looked at the Ten Commandments. Um, we said God's law is, is good. It's beneficial. Um, it, it's a way to human flourishing, and, and it protects us, um, and it, 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 it's good, good advice. Um, for our lives. God is, is wise in giving His law, and so we're thankful for the law. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, being under grace um, does not give us license to ignore God's commands and, and live however we want to haphazardly. Um, if anything, uh, God's law gives us the increasing ability um, 
or, or grace gives us the increasing ability to be uh, obedient and, and want to please God and follow His good directions for our lives. And so uh, James is, is talking about uh, when he says, if, if, if you keep the, yourself from these, you, you do well. He's, he's kind of talking about our new humanity, uh, how Jesus makes a, a difference in our lives. And so um, we should no longer pursue or, or worship idols because we, we worship the one true God. Uh, we don't drink and, and eat animal blood um, like a lot of pagan rituals did for, for maybe strength or, or vitality. Uh, we trust in the, the, the blood of Jesus that gives us uh, eternal life because He has shed His blood for our sins. Um, sexual intimacy is a, a good gift from God uh, to be enjoyed within His design of, of marriage. And, and James, is, uh, by giving these prohibitions, is giving us kind of practical examples of how our faith should be worked out in, in our daily lives, especially uh, here to these Gentiles in, in the context of which they lived in that day and age. Um, and so there are some who would say that this uh, passage is solely about cultural norms, uh, that these prohibition, prohibitions were uh, temporary for the these Gentiles then and, and that time period, um, but they're not for us today. Uh, they were for, for these Gentiles living um, trying to keep peace in a Jewish culture. Um, however, there are some, some issues with kind of just saying that's the, the case, with taking that approach. Um, idolatry and, and participation in idol worship uh, are prohibited throughout Scripture. Uh, sexual immorality is prohibited throughout Scripture. We wouldn't lump those two together and say, well, that's just a cultural thing. It no longer applies to us. Uh, so why would we do that with, with eating blood? Um, and when we look at the Bible and, and where um, abstaining from the consumption of, of blood occurs, it's, it's not in the law of Moses. It, it precedes that, right? Um, does anybody know where God talks about that for the first time? Put you on the spot. Everybody's too afraid to answer. It's okay. We're here to learn. Um, it, it's with Noah, right? Um, you remember when Noah gets off the ark and, and God says that all the animals can be eaten for, for food, um, but to, to refrain from consuming the blood because the life is in the blood. So even um, when he's speaking to Noah, preceding Moses, preceding the tabernacle, um, he, he's talking about eating the animal flesh, um, but not consuming blood because life is in the blood. And so I told you, uh, we would answer more than, than what was asked because um, we're not done with this yet. Uh, but since it's connected, I, I want to chase this just a little bit further. Um, and the reason is because there's connections throughout the entirety of Scripture. And so if there's questions about this, um, then we need to be able to, to answer those. Um, because somebody might say, well, well, didn't Paul say it's okay to eat food sacrificed to idols? Um, in 1 Corinthians 10, and I, I didn't put this on the, the, the screen to kind of save some time, but you can look at that yourself. Um, Paul doesn't exactly say that. Um, he still uses some discernment when he's speaking about food offered to idols. Uh, Paul does say that you can feel free to uh, eat food, that you, you purchase meat from the marketplace. Uh, that meat may or may not can, uh, come from someone who has sacrificed that to an idol uh, or used in, in idol worship. Uh, but his point is that is, uh, if the meat is in the marketplace, it's being sold for common use. It's no longer being actively used in worship to an idol. And so if something's sold in the meat market, it's, it's common. Feel free to, to purchase that meat and, and use that uh, to feed yourself and your, your, your family. Um, but... He goes on to say, if you are eating with someone uh, and they promote the food that they're serving as being offered to an idol. And so uh, I go to Keith's house. Keith, you shouldn't sit up front. I always pick on you. Uh, I go to, to Keith's house and, and he's got some, some steaks on the table. And he says, well, I, I offered these to my God earlier today. And so we're giving thanks to that God for this food that we're, we're eating 
Paul says, don't partake. That's where you draw the line. If it's offered something common, and it, you, know, you, you don't know if it was used for idol worship or not, but it's in the market, marketplace, now it's common. Um, but if you go to somebody's house and, and they're promoting this as this is used in actively worshiping an idol, Paul says, abstain from that um, for, for their conscience and for yours. And so uh, because that, that's considered being involved in taking part, uh, participating with that other person in their idolatry, so that's where, where Paul draws the line. Um, and so I, I know that was kind of a small detour, but again, um, it, it, it's all connected. And so we, we see these little hyperlinks and these uh, connections in Scripture, and, and we want to chase those out. We should um, to, to answer questions and, and get an understanding about what uh, the context is and about what the author is writing in their letters. And so um, now back to the, the stake. Um, that being said, can we eat a, a steak rare? Um, yeah, uh, because the the red liquid that is we see coming from the steak uh, that is not blood. Um, the The red liquid that we see uh, is myoglobin. Um, all the the beef, the pork, the poultry that we eat um, has been has been drained of, of blood as it is being processed. Um, and so that red liquid, it's called myoglobin. Um, and so it's a protein, uh, kind of a, a watery protein um, that helps deliver oxygen to the cells with, within the muscular tissue. Uh, and so like blood, it, it contains iron. Uh, it's getting iron and nutrients to the, the cells. And so when it is exposed to oxygen, uh, it turns red, and so that's why it has that red colorization. Um, fun fact for the day, um, it, the reason um, poultry and, and pork um, are considered white meat is because they don't have as much myoglobin as, as beef, and so that's why beef is red meat and pork and, and poultry are white meat. It's probably way more than, than you wanted to know, uh, but we answered the question, right? And so, there you go. You can have a, a rare steak for lunch today. And so, uh, the next question, and this is really the, the last one that uh, we'll, we'll pick up on today. Um, and this is where all sins considered unintentional. And so, when we talked about the sin offering and the guilt offering, we, we talked about unintentional sins um, and sinning unintentionally. And so the Bible does uh, recognize categories of, of sin. And so we, we often talk about two categories when, when we've talked about sin before, and that is sins of omission and sins of commission, right? And so those are two categories of sin. And so uh, sins of commission is when we do something that we should not have done, and sins of omission is when we fail to do things that we should be doing, right? So both of those are a way of sinning against God, of, of either trespassing and kind of overstepping our, our boundaries, uh, doing what God has said, you, you shouldn't do that, that's not good, uh, that, that's against my character, against my design. Uh, but it also, uh, sins of omission is, is when we fail to uh, love people like we should, we fail to, to help people uh, like we should, and, and, and that's a, a way of sinning as well. And so uh, another way of, of looking at, at sin, some, some other categories in Leviticus, and the books kind of surrounding Leviticus um, are categorizing sin as unintentional sin, um, which we saw, and that is maybe you did something wrong and, and you uh, didn't know it was wrong until later, uh, and you find out, hey, I shouldn't have done that, and so that's kind of an unintentional sin. Uh, but most often we said an un unintentional sin is, is a, a lapse in judgment. Um, it's an error or mistake um, based on maybe kind of rash actions or uh, somebody makes us really angry. Uh, if, if you're like me and, and sometimes you have a short fuse and you do something without thinking just out of your anger, uh, you're kind of blinded by your, your rage. We use that kind of language. And so this is something that we've, we've spontaneously acted without 
uh, giving something thought and considering our, our actions. Um, and really, unintentional sin is, is anything that is acting kind of outside of, of our norms, right? Uh, it's something that we normally wouldn't do. Uh, it's an error. It's a mistake. <coughs> Excuse me. It's out of character for us. So that's one category. Uh, the other category uh, is what we see is, is called a high-handed sin. And so uh, we see the, this again in, in Numbers um, 15. If one person sins unintentionally, he shall offer a female goat a year old for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement before the Lord for the person who makes a mistake. Uh, when he sins unintentionally to make atonement for him, and he shall be forgiven. You shall have one law for him who does anything unintentionally, for him who is a native among the people of Israel, and for the stranger who sojourns among them. And here's our other category. But the person who does anything with a high hand, whether he is a native or sojourner, reviles the Lord. And that person shall be cut off from among his people, because he has despised the word of the Lord, and has broken his commandment. That person shall be utterly cut off, and his iniquity shall be on him. And so a, a high-handed sin is a complete rejection of God. It's, it's being set against him, uh, despising his word, uh, reviling or, or blaspheming his name. And so you can kind of think of this... Uh, Think of about this as uh, raising your, your fist up at God or, or giving God the finger. I mean, it's, it's a total rejection of, of what God is saying. Um, and just a, a few examples of this that we do see in Scripture. Um, if you remember in the Exodus, Pharaoh, he kept hardening and hardening his heart against God, and he, he just outright refused uh, to listen to God. Uh, the, in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll see... Uh, an episode where Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, uh, they offer strange fire to God. They totally reject God's warning and His instructions, and they say, we're, we're, we're going to do this our own way. We're, we're going to ignore what God has said and, and approach this our own way, and God kills them. Uh, in Numbers, we see something kind of similar to that. Korah, Datham, and Abiram, um, they kind of uh, attempt this mutiny, and they say, Moses, you're not fit to lead us. We deserve to, to be the leaders. Uh, we're just as good as you are. And, and God causes the earth to, to open up and, and swallow them. Uh, the earth swallows them. Uh, and then also in, in Numbers, uh, when the spies return from spying out the land and the people complain, uh, God says, okay, you're, you're not going into Canaan. You're going to wander in the wilderness uh, for the next 40 years <clears throat> because you refuse to listen to me. You, you've rejected uh, what I've put out here and offered for you to, to receive. And so uh, the question of the Bible as we, we think about this uh, is not will you sin. The Bible knows that we're going to sin. God, God knows that we are going to sin. Uh, we're going to mess up. We're going to make mistakes. The question that God has for us in Scripture is, will you confess and admit that you've sinned? And, and we need to, to really understand that, guys. The, the question is not, will you mess up and will you sin? We, we all sin. The question is, will you admit that you've sinned? Will you confess to God that, hey, you, you've tried to do this your own way? that you need a Savior, and, and will you trust in, in Jesus and what He has done for salvation? That, that's the question of the Bible. And so the high-handed sin, when we think about this in correlation to the, the New Testament and how that theme is, is kind of stretched out, uh, it, it's a rejection of the gospel. Um, it's, Jesus talks about the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit um, it, it's not believing and trusting in Jesus despite the Holy Spirit's witness about who He is. Um, it's, it's, it's hearing the Word. It's being convicted. Um, it, it's, it's hearing that and, and just rejecting it and refusing to accept what God is offering us uh, for salvation. And so if you're concerned about this, let me, let me say this. 
Um, if you're truly worried or, or truly concerned about um, reaching a state where you're unforgivable unfor- or, or you've gone too far, um, first of all, your, your concern, uh, your doubts, and your worries are really evidence that your heart is still soft because you wouldn't be worried about it if you didn't care. Um, and the second thing I would say is, is you're never too far gone. You're not. God's grace is sufficient to forgive you for, for whatever you've done. You, you, you will never reach a, a point where His grace can't reach you. But don't die in your rejection of who Jesus is and what He has done for you. God loves you. Jesus died for your sins. God wants that relationship with you. He loves everyone here, and he wants that relationship with us. And salvation is is just a gift that that we receive. God has has done it all. He he paid every last penny through the blood of his Son. And so we receive salvation as a a gift by faith. It's not like a a trophy we earn for for being good people. It's a gift that that he offers us to, to freely receive. And so... The second thing I would say is, or third thing I would say is, is don't put it off any longer. Um, if you're worried about that, if you're concerned about that, if you have doubts, and am I truly a Christian? If I died right now, um, would I, I go to heaven or would I go to hell? If you have those kind of thoughts, guys, please see me or, or see uh, one of the elders, see Keith or, or Scott or Matt, and, and we would love to talk to you. Because God doesn't want us to, to worry about this. He, he wants us to give, to give us real peace that we, we can know what our eternal destiny is. Uh, he, he wants us to have a, a peace about that. And so that's what I, I would say when we think about um, sinning unintentionally or, or those high-handed sins. Um, we, we, we want everyone here um, to have that assurance that they know uh, where they would spend eternity, because you know we're we're, we're not guaranteed tomorrow. Um, you know, catastrophe can can happen at any time, and uh, the Bible is very clear that it's appointed once for for all men to die, and then comes the judgment, and and we need to be ready. And so, if you have questions, if you have concerns about that, please see someone uh, about that, and and we would love to talk to you. Um, and so. Really, that's the four main questions that I wanted to talk about this morning. Um, just out of, of curiosity, and, and we'll pray. Um, does anyone have anything else? Did I complicate anything else that you, hey, what about this um, that you would ask? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be honest with you and say I, I, I don't know for sure. I don't think so. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't. I, I think that was a. I think they they kind of owned it and managed it, but it didn't mean that no one else could could live there. Um, so other people could live there. Um, the other thing that I, I didn't mention, but we kind of talked about this morning, is um, eventually I, I know. When we're talking about the startup of this, you know, you think about the Levites and the priest, and you think, well, how many priests are there? Um, that that priesthood kind of grows as the the population grows, and and you know, forty eight cities that that's a lot of people. That's not a, a small number of, of people. And so, um, one thing that eventually happens is, and I, I don't know when this really happened. But the, as best I can tell from reading a lot of Jewish commentary and, and resources and, and discussions on the priesthood, um, it was almost kind of like doctors on call and so or, or on a rotation. And so the high priest, he was the high priest, and he was high priest until he died. And that is kind of what the, the cities of refuge, when, when someone, if someone accidentally murdered someone, they could go to those cities of refuge so somebody couldn't take revenge on them. And they stayed there um, 
for a certain amount of time or until the high, a new high priest was initiated after the death of the old high priest. And so the high priest was high priest for a long time. But the priest that helped the high priest, it, it seems that they kind of could go to those cities and live and they had a set time that they came and, and served for a period of time and then they went back home to those cities. So they, they their their life wasn't tied up into just the tabernacle service, but they kind of rotated in and out. So anybody else? Okay. All right. I hope I didn't bore everyone to death. Um, I, I think this stuff is interesting and, and thank you guys for asking questions. Um, it's it's cool to learn together. I, I just I love it. Um, and I hope we, we have that happening in Sunday school classes. I know we do. Um, but that, that's what it's about, is, is learning together. Um, and not only learning the, the facts and the information, but also um, encouraging one another and, and getting to the place where not only do we understand and can kind of piece the story together, but we learn how to live this stuff out practically um, and, and how we deal with, with people in, in our everyday lives. So... Uh, let's pray, and uh, you guys can be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your word. Um, we thank you for our, our time spent just studying, learning more about you, uh, seeing these beautiful pictures that you have painted through rituals in Leviticus and, and uh, the offerings that were given and how that reflects what Jesus has done for us and how he is the, the greater priest and the greater sacrifice. Um, God, we just thank you for that. God, I pray that you would uh, continue to encourage us, um, continue to be with us, walk with us each day. Um, God, that if there's someone here that, that doesn't know you, um, that they would give their life to you, uh, that they would receive the salvation that you freely give, that you purchased for us on the cross. and um, Just ask questions if they have those uh, so they can have peace uh, with you. And uh, Lord, we ask that you be with our mission partners, uh, continue to help them, and we're so thankful for the, the good reports and the progress that we're hearing about. And um, just ask that you would continue to have your hand in those ministries and uh, continue to help us as a, a church family here uh, to, to represent you and to glorify you through our interactions with our friends and our neighbors and our co-workers. And uh, God, we just want to lift up your name because you're worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a good week.